In July 2011, Renat Dre was giving birth to her third child. But there were no clinical signs that anything was wrong. There was no reason that, that she required a C-section. A young mother is suing a New York hospital. She claimed she was given a cesarean section against her will. Ultimately, when you went into your C-section, had you given consent? No, I never did. And in her chart, her physician just wrote, I'm overriding her refusal of a C-section. They tied her down, anesthetized her, and cut her open without her consent. Renadre's story is an extreme case, but it's emblematic of the treatment women increasingly fear when giving birth at a hospital. Across the country, stories have emerged of hospitals using threats, and sometimes force, to coerce mothers into unnecessary and often risky procedures. Physicians telling their patients uh, that their baby is going to die if they don't let them do X, Y, or Z. And in the vast majority of those cases, that's just not true. You're bringing your child into the world. You need to be able to trust your providers. In one case, a court ordered a critically ill woman in Washington, D.C. to undergo a C-section against her will. Neither she nor the baby survived. Our medical system isn't just meant to be a refuge from harm. It's the place we all trust and turn to to get better, where we most expect our autonomy to be respected. So why are so many birthing mothers being abused by it? To better understand this problem, we need to understand the history of how America gives birth. In the early part of the 20th century, women are giving birth, usually at home, with a sort of suite of lay caregivers, neighbors and, and other folks who are helping them out. Now in the United States, over 98% of births occur in hospitals. Today's infant and maternal mortality rates are far lower than they were a century ago, owed in part to medical advances in hospital care that help high-risk women through pregnancy. Medicalization of birth has saved a lot of lives. The problem becomes when we think that we should use all of those medical tools on every other low-risk woman who comes in the door. Does he give his patients all the benefits of modern obstetric art? So what starts to happen sort of 1910s into the 1920s is a series of regulations that are set up. It's explicit that the goal is to get more women into physician practices to give birth uh, and away from traditional midwives. There's a, actually a wonderful, um, well, wonderful in the cynical sense of the word, but article that talks about the fact that medical students don't have enough clinical material to practice on. And what, of course, he's referring to is clinical material is women's bodies. They can't figure out how to do C-sections and they can't figure out how to do all these other things if women are being seen by midwives and not by doctors. The medical profession worked with state governments to seize the birth industry, writing licensing laws that made it hard and often illegal for then popular midwives to practice, over time leaving many mothers with hospitals as their only real birth option. At the end of World War II, President Truman wanted to improve the country's hospitals, and Congress responded. They wrote the Hill-Burton Act of 1946, which funded construction of new hospitals and renovations of existing ones. So you pump all of this federal money into hospitals. And in order to do that, they actually create these blueprints of what these hospitals should look like. And those blueprints end up really calcifying maternity care. Because of the actual physical structure of the hospitals, it meant that it was very hard to change things after the fact. As the hospitals get standardized, patients get standardized too. And you can actually see this in the way that they describe those early hospitals that the Hilburton Act created is an assembly line. You move mothers from room to room, you move them from place to place, you, you keep them on this assembly line in order to keep the hospital efficient. So it becomes much less about what does this laboring woman need and what does the hospital system need. In the 80s, professor of architecture Rosalind Lindheim studied the design of those hospitals, writing that the same techniques used to expedite the manufacture of weapons in World War II had been used to expedite laboring women through hospitals, with the interest of keeping the flow of patients moving. A 1964 hospital design textbook approvingly discussed conveyor belt design, claiming that it emphasizes the repeated transference of a mother, as in a motor car assembly, from place to place, and warns that a woman spending an unpredictable amount of time in any one stage of labor is uneconomical to the hospital's process. Assembly line obstetrics most likely did help with hospital efficiency, but it also drove doctors to pressure women into choices that keep the assembly line moving. The logic was very clear that we want to make this like a factory, right? We want to learn from the automotive industry how to, how to get people to give birth. While licensing laws and the Hill-Burton Act worked to industrialize birth and bring women into hospitals, 
Another major law began driving a rise in needless surgeries and procedures within the hospital. After the Hilburton Act, you have the creation of Medicare. They created this fee-for-service payment system. And what the fee-for-service payment system does is it says, we're going to pay you for every procedure that you do for, on a patient. We're not going to pay you in terms of the quality of that outcome. When you provide incentives like that, what you see is a skyrocketing of procedures. You start seeing a dramatic increase in the number of procedures that physicians can bill for and a dramatic use of those procedures um, simply because they can be billed for. And the reality is that the U.S. has the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world. And the reason for that is in part the fact that we do so many interventions on women. They gave me an epidural, um, not because I wanted it, because she said, if you don't get it, then your baby's going to die. Yeah. Her shift ended at midnight. We're getting close to 11 o'clock. And she was like, I think we're going to have to like do a C-section. Like, you're not progressing. And I was like, you know, we didn't even give it a chance to work. And there's just like this moment where I felt like this immense pressure to like acquiesce to what she wanted. Um, and I, you know, I've obviously looked back on that moment a lot in the last five years. In 1949, the World Medical Association enshrined a code of ethics in something called the Physician's Pledge, a voluntary vow taken by graduating med students. It's existed in many forms over the years, the most recent version bearing the line, I will respect the autonomy and dignity of my patient. The reality is that these are not people who go into medicine in order to harm women. This is not what's going on. It's the fact that they're working within an institutional structure that makes ethical decision making, that makes informed consent very, very difficult. Providers feel an enormous amount of pressure to push back against maternal preferences that slow down the system. But this increasing ability to individualize treatment comes at a time when pressures are heaviest to make the doctor a cog in a machine. Now who will suffer if the federal government forces the nation's doctors to practice assembly line medicine? The answer is clear. The machinery of American healthcare policy has done a lot of damage to our institutions of birth, and it threatens what should be an honored value, the right of a mother, armed with honest information, to choose freely how she brings a life into the world.